Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to the Open Web Application Security Project. We are the London chapter and this is our fifth event this year. There will be two more next week, I'll talk about this a bit later. Um, so this is the agenda for today. I hope you all had a bit of working and beer. Pizza is a little bit delayed, so pizza will be here for break time. So um, I'm going to present my welcome speech is a bit of an uh, update on all the OWASP news and you know, projects, after which we're going to try to connect over Skype to Toronto, to Canada, where we're going to have a remote talk about OWASP's app, Jenkins plugin, which has just been released. Um, and uh, I'll show you the introduction to that. Then we're going to have uh, Jeremy talking about PCI and uh, what changes uh, might await us after Brexit and the uh, payments, data breaches and uh, uh, some SSL news as well. After which we're going to have a break, a uh, bit more beer, hopefully pizza will arrive. And then Gareth will present his talk on JSON hijacking. Then we have Shane talking about um, how he introduced an institute of security champions into a BBC or working on my BBC project um, as a BBC and then we're going to stay a bit longer for more networking and beer. So for those of you who don't know us, I'm Sam Stefanian and this is Sheriff Mansouk. We are your chapter leaders. Uh, we've been running the chapter for the past year exactly now. So those of you who are here for the first time, I'm not sure how you found out about this event but there are ways how you can find out because you can join our mailing list, this is the best way, this is a really, really old-fashioned way of letting people know what's happening, but it's a really low-volume mailing list, we promise we will not spam you, we only send email when there is an event, so it's a quite useful thing to sign up, uh, just Google for OWASP London. Uh, those of you who are on Twitter, uh, can just follow OWASP London on Twitter, and uh, if you're on Facebook, you can like our page, also OWASP London. And uh, you can subscribe to our OWASP London channel on YouTube now. Finally, we've got our own channel. As you know, all our talks are videoed. That sure brings his camera and uh, uh, videos everything and then puts everything on YouTube uh, in about one week's time. And all the presentations from tonight are going to be available on OWASP.org. You can just download them in video format or PowerPoint. Uh, those of you on Slack, some of you are developers, you can also chat to us on Chapter London channel on Slack. So who are we? For those of you who don't know, we are a global non-profit organization and we are focused on improving security of software and focused on promoting the application security, making it visible, educating developers. We are completely vendor neutral and even though we are supported by the um, uh, multiple security vendors, absolutely vendor neutral, we are not allowed to promote any particular solution or any brand. Was it a good thing about us that OWASP is, uh, pre presents a collective wisdom of the best minds in application security worldwide. We have chapters all over the world, and I'm going to talk to you a bit later how many we've got, um, because we provide free tools, guidance, documentation for developers, for penetration testers, everything to make software security better. Okay? We are all volunteers, so there are 45,000 volunteers worldwide for OWASP Global. Uh, we're in about 100 countries, there's a chapter, and uh, uh, all the chapter events are free. All our software tools available to download absolutely free. All the documentation, guidance, standards, books that we provide, everything is free. The only thing which is not free is conferences. I'll talk about it a little bit later. So, um, OWASP as a charity, you can become a member, but membership really means that uh, you just provide a donation of 50 US dollars a year, so it's not that much money really. However, obviously it helps. This is how we can keep all our projects uh, going. And obviously it also gives you some benefits and discounts when you actually uh, attend application security or cyber security conferences, and you can get discounts ranging from 20% to 70% to some of the conferences. Uh, for those representing corporations, you can always um, join as a corporation, so I'll talk about it later. Uh, there are some uh, corporations, uh, corporate uh, members, who are our sponsors. So let's not forget that tonight is Thanksgiving, so our colleagues in the USA are not, hopefully, watching any um, application security-related events. They are eating turkey, okay? But uh, these companies that we have on the screen are actually the companies who uh, support uh, OWASP London chapter. And uh, as you can see, people at Skype, Expedia, and Empiric, which hosts us tonight, are the organizations which provide very kindly their facilities, 
and they feed us, provide us drinks, and give us this opportunity to uh, present the talks in application security. Um, the corporate members are on screen at the moment, so I hope some of you will recognize um, uh, some logos. They could be a company you work for or you know them. There are many, many, many of them, and we get new um, members joining almost every month. Uh, there is a bit of a news, obviously these are the premier members, so you will recognize probably Quality Salesforce, uh, 45. There's a new member just joined us a week ago, Waratech. Those of you who don't know, they provide the uh, real application security protection solution. So it's a new, new kid on the block. Uh, I'm pretty sure those of you who are in corporate environments will get a call from these guys. Okay. Um, so the big, the big news coming up is um, that OWASP organizes application security conferences. So there are two big conferences every year. There's uh, AppSec USA and AppSec Europe. And I'm very happy to announce that AppSec Europe next year is going to be in the UK in May, and it's going to be in Northern Ireland, in Belfast, from 8 till 12th of May. There will be a um, uh, conference there. There will be training days, and there will be lots and lots of speakers, lots and lots of talks, lots of people to network, and uh, it's not that expensive, so check it out. So those of you who are members of OWASP will get a very good discount to attend it. I will be attending and hopefully I will present the talk there as well. Okay, so as you can see, uh, Belfast is very proud to present. And uh, you can see they were recently featured and visit Belfast and uh, website and all the local uh, news that the Premier Cyber Security Conference is coming to them. And the lovely girl in the middle is Michelle Simpson, who is the chapter leader for OWASP Belfast. I oh, actually have another chapter leader from the UK, the lovely Katie Anton it is. She is the chapter leader for Bristol. So those of you who are based in West Country, yeah, make sure you check out OWASP Bristol because Katie organizes uh, similar events. And there was one just, uh, I think, 10 days ago, if you, uh, last week, uh, when uh, um, I think some presentations are already available from that one. Uh, another big event coming up, if uh, some of you are from the Middle East, there is an OWASP Middle East conference happening as well. That will be in Dubai. And it, it's uh, a little bit before our Belfast conference. It's from 3rd and 4th of May 2017. So they say this is Middle East largest cyber security conference. So those of you who are going to be in Dubai in May, okay, check it out, register now, check out the speakers. We'll be presenting there. Okay, so um, a couple of words about other OWASP chapters. So today, as I speak now, a little bit earlier today, there was an OWASP Benelux Day. Um, and uh, today is the second day, so that was happening in Belgium today. So those of you who are uh, from Belgium, from Germany, or Luxembourg, or we regularly commute to that area, uh, make sure that check out their chapters because they organize this two-day conference, which is also absolutely free, and they get some really good speakers. Okay. And in Germany, there's also an OWASP uh, Germany Day happening Monday, Tuesday. So those of you who are traveling are going to be in Germany uh, next week. Check it out as well. Uh, again, absolutely free event for you will be in Darmstadt. Another big announcement. So on Monday and Tuesday, we are running a hackathon event and capture the flag competition. So it is for developers. I know some penetration test is registered, but please don't because it's for developers. So on day one on Monday, we're actually going to um, show developers uh, how vulnerabilities in the code actually, how do they um, manifest themselves in web applications, how they can be exploited, and how they can be fixed. And on Tuesday, we're going to have a competition where the developers will have to find vulnerable codes in real life applications, for example, a copy of real life applications like online banking, mobile apps, e commerce websites, and as you find vulnerabilities, you progress to the next level and score points. If you don't know if you can't find a vulnerability, you can ask for hints. But every time you ask for a hint, you lose some points. Obviously, the teams who win or the developer who scores the most points will get prizes. So we'll get uh, prizes sorted out. They will be provided by um, our um, security vendors who generously donate some prizes. So we've got a um, and this was drone and a Bluetooth speaker. Price for the first and second place. Um, the price for the third place we can't disclose at the moment. Okay. <laughs> so another big thing we're doing uh, as a chapter, we're helping out the um, DevSec uh, Con DevSec conferences with a summit. There will be a joint OWASP DevSec Con summit. 
that we are planning to do in April. It will be a five-day event, and we are looking for contributors. So if you guys are in DevOps and you're interested in security, you're interested to participate, you're interested to speak, you're interested to bring your developers, your DevOps specialist, please talk to us. Please search for all us that's called Summit. We have started to uh, gather some intelligence in terms of um, information on GitHub. And if you can propose some talks, that would be absolutely fantastic. We're going to start meeting uh, regularly with the organizers and uh, in London, hopefully. And yeah, this is going to be quite a big conference for five days. So um, I urge you to check it out. There will be lots of very interesting talks presented there. In terms of news of the projects, uh, there is a new project called OWASP VB Scan. Uh, as you know, every time we have a meeting, I always talk about the new project. So this project just released. It has nothing to do with Visual Basic. VB is for the, uh, uh, the notorious V bulletin system, which has been um, recently affected with a lot of uh, security issues. So now there's a scanner for it, which has just been released. So if you want to check it out, I urge you to check it out. Another piece of news. We are preparing a uh, mobile application security verification standard. It's currently version 09, not released yet, it's in beta. So if any of you are doing anything with mobile security and mobile apps area, uh, please check out the standard, please contribute to it, please provide your feedback, or just see if you can start implementing it within your development teams. Um, it's going to be released soon, hopefully, uh, early next year. Uh, you can't read any of this stuff here, <laughs> but there is an, it's, it's the 10 of OWASP Mobile Top 10 2016. As you know, uh, OWASP Top 10 is our top 10 vulnerabilities or top 10 risks that we release. And the last release was in 2013. 2016 is being prepared for web applications. But for mobile applications, there's no release candidate. So please check it out and see if you can contribute uh, before it's released. And yeah, if, if you want to use it, just start using it. Another project which had an update recently is OWASP uh, Dependency Checker. So OWASP Dependency Checker is a really cool tool which allows you to um, scan your development project and check out if you've got any third party components or open source libraries which have known vulnerabilities. And uh, which is uh, uh, OWASP number nine in the OWASP top, nine, uh, top 10 vulnerabilities. So number nine is components with known vulnerabilities. So what this project allows you to do is allows you to find out which libraries within your code, within your product, have no vulnerabilities and what you can do about it. But well, usually you just have to upgrade. So a lot of people just release a product, they have no idea that they have vulnerable libraries. Okay. And obviously the next big update that we had was on OWASP Zap, which is our flagship uh, penetration testing and vulnerability scanning tool. Um, We've done a lot of work on this. If you know recently, and Sharif is actually working on the project team very closely with the guys. So I'm going to pass the microphone to him so he can explain what's going on. I'm going to try to dial in to Canada to see if we can get our first lightning talk speaker to present this talk over Skype. So, hi everyone. Uh, how many of you were here last time in uh, for September's talk? Okay. So some of you may remember that um, one of the things that we did was we contributed some uh, code to the Zap project in order to integrate security testing into the SDLC. Um, since then, the repository for the code, for the community um, um, uh, scripts, went from about 10 people a day to about 300. So we realized there's a little bit of demand. Um, so, uh, as part of the automation uh, presentations that uh, Simon Bennett, the project lead, was doing, um, one member of the open source community uh, reached out, who was Goran, and he said that he's been building like a Jenkins plugin. Uh, does anyone here know, uh, doesn't know what Jenkins is? Or what does it do? So this is like a continuous in integration server if you want to automate pushing code out or building code. Um, that's um, that's a server that you'd use. So it's good for being able to automate um, several processes. Um, what they've done is they created a plugin for Jenkins so that you can create a plan that says, you know, every time I'm about to release code, I would like you to scan this website and find where it passes or fails to build. So um, here's a 
in a second. Uh, Goran will go through and talk about it. Um, we have done something a little bit um, unconventional with first releases is we try to document it as much as we possibly could. Um, so we've done uh, some YouTube videos on sort of the demos and how it works. Um, we document it and uh, in a second uh, Goran will be here and uh, will show us um, how it works. Uh, I will say one thing before we begin and that is um, the plugin uh, is supposed to make your life a little bit easier because instead of writing all the um, all the scripts, all the API calls to Zap in order to automate um, uh, security testing in a development lifecycle, you have just a bunch of parameters that you can put into Jenkins via web interface. However, if you're not using Jenkins, you're using something like Atlassian Bamboo, and Bamboo is awesome, uh, you can still do this, you just need to um, uh, write the build plan yourself, um, but this makes things uh, incredibly uh, uh, easier. So, uh, is uh, Goran ready, Sam? Yeah. Goran, uh, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear us? Yeah, I think we're on. Okay, so we'll... Yeah, it's all yours now. So, do you need the mic here? Yeah, I'll switch the mic. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sam. Uh, thank you very much for having me, Sosha. I'm the lead developer on the Telephone 7 program. Uh, as mentioned by Sharif and Sam. I think you should. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Let's switch on the mic. Uh, on. Yeah, well, let's see. This week. Could you talk? Hello? I'm not sure if you're in the sound as well. Let me see if we can get the sound a bit better. Can you guys hear him at the back? No? Hello, hello? Yeah, we can hear you. It's just that we want to see if it's a little bit better. We're getting something now. Okay. Uh, so we're going to see if we can put it in the next week here. Okay. So this will just take a couple of minutes. One second. I just want to thank you for having me. Uh, I'm the lead developer on the Zap Jenkins plugin project. Uh, so since you're already familiar with Zap, Sheriff haven't gone and taken you through it, I'm going to get into what you need to get a functioning Zap Jenkins plugin to work and kick off your build. At the very top, you're going to need Jenkins. In this case, we can uh, we have a very we're very compatible with the very first version of Jenkins, which is 1.58, all the way to the latest stable release. You need a working version of Zap. Right now, we are supporting the latest weekly releases. However, in the future, we plan to support the standard releases. Uh, currently, the standard release is 2.5, but it won't work with that. So you'll have to either use a weekly release or wait until 2.6. However, we encourage you to try with the weekly releases as your feedback will drive our development and fix as many bugs as we can. Uh, one nice feature that we have added is that you can integrate your uh, Selenium tests and functional tests as part of your Zap vulnerability tests. That way you'll be able to turn your uh, functional tests into vulnerability tests. Uh, for that, you need a working version of Firefox uh, that is compatible with the Selenium driver. So the purpose of this video and PowerPoint slide is to take you through the installation phase of each the setup and configuration phase of each, and how to finally run a Zap Jenkins scan via. So what can the Zap Jenkins plugin do for you? For right now, it can do almost everything that the Zap UI can, which is manage sessions. You can either load existing sessions that you've already created with the Zap UI, they're interchangeable, or persist a new session after you've done your Selenium script. You're able to define a context uh, for that, you need to provide a unique name, include the URLs of your website, and exclude any URLs that you don't want scanned. 
that were able to perform a spider scan, an Ajax spider, and an active scan. To make things easier on you, and I know that everybody in modern applications, you need authentication. So currently we support form-based and script-based authentication for the spider scan and the active scan. Uh, the Ajax spider, at, as we're working towards getting the plugin and improving upon it, we're also improving upon the Zap API. So uh, THC, uh, Ricardo, is working on adding Ajax Spider support to the API, and you will see an authenticated Ajax Spider soon in, as part of the plugin as well. Uh, I mentioned earlier that you're able to run it as a pre-build step with a Selenium step beforehand. This is so that Selenium will run, Zap will listen as an intercepting proxy in the back end, and map your website. After you have your website structure there, you'll be able to create your context and then perform any scans, in this case a spider scan or an active scan. And finally, what would all of this be for if you can't generate a report that's one-to-one -one with what you have in the alerts tree? So you will be able to export an HTML, an XML, or a JSON report, which you can either use for as a developer for debugging and troubleshooting, or you can give uh, and hand off to management. So how does that fit into a continuous integration environment? We have Jenkins at the very top. So you have Jenkins sitting at the very top, and it will initialize a Zap build step. Traffic will flow through Zap as part of regression packs, and Zap will act as an intercepting proxy between your target application and the internet. The target application, Zap will actually modify uh, the requests to include vulnerability data. The target application will then send a response back to Zap and then to Jenkins. The reporting data that Zap generated goes back to Jenkins, and Jenkins will then archive all your reports as part of the build, and then you also have the option of publishing it to Jira. So let's go through the installation phase just a little bit. For Jenkins, you need a compatible version. In this case, we support 1.58.1, which is one of the very early releases of Jenkins. You're going to create a Jenkins folder and extract the word file into it. You are going to create a Jenkins home environment variable and set it to match the Jenkins folder. And then you're going to start Jenkins from the command line. Uh, Jenkins will prompt you then to uh, install your own suggestion plugins or their required plugins. This is during the installation phase on first run. You're just going to pick the required plugins. After Jenkins is up and running, you will want to install these, the following four plugins. One is the Environment Injector plugin, the Summary Display plugin, the HTML Publisher plugin, and the Zap plugin. The, the Zap plugin is necessary to interact with Zap and generate the reports, whereas the other three plugins provide the necessary functionality, uh, such as archiving for the build. In terms of Zap, you are going to download, as mentioned before, a weekly release. Uh, the current version that I'm using is the September 5th. However, it should work with any release. I've tested several of them. Uh, you will create a Zap home folder, create a Zap proxy home environment variable and point it to the folder, and then modify your zap.bat file just a little bit to include uh, the Zap proxy home before the jar. And then finally, you will run Zap from the command line pointing it to the zapp.bat and providing an installed directory. In the event that you are using Firefox and uh, in, the, sorry, in the event that you are using Selenium and want to run in a Selenium script, you're going to need a compatible version with Firefox. Currently it has the Jenkins plugin has only been tested with Firefox. I have not had a chance to test it with Chrome. You can through a command line change uh, Zap settings to use Chrome if you like. However, please note that that is currently unsupported uh, for the Jenkins plugin, so I suggest Firefox. Uh, the setup settings will be the exact same as you would for setting up Zap in the first place, which is you need to configure your local proxy settings in Firefox. Change it to manual proxy, set the HTTP proxy to your local host or an IP that you're comfortable with, and set the port. In this case, if you are proxying on local host, you are going to want to remove the no proxy for you. Finally, you have to make this uh, changes one-to-one -one with Zap in itself in the UI, and you will change Zap's local proxy to be set to the same as you just did in Firefox and the same port. 
once you have all of that set up, you can go into Jenkins and go into your admin configurations, at which point you can set the default host and the default port. Uh, this does not need to match the Zap settings, but it does need to match what you want in Firefox. So in this case, the Firefox settings. Finally, it comes to feed it, just as you would in an original Zap UI scan, you would have to provide some information on the structure of your website. Now you can either start Zap manually, as mentioned before, and map your website, then persist the session, or you can write a Selenium script, which can then uh, do all of this for you during the build in Jenkins. If you do it manually, you will want to load the session in uh, Jenkins. If you want to do it with the, the Selenium script, then you configure the build to run the Selenium script, as I'll go into in a moment. So right here, what we have as a video is we're manually mapping the website in Zap. We are just clicking on the tabs, providing a basic structure. We're going to do a single authentication attempt after I've already created a user prior to this. And we're going to log out once. Now we're just going to remove some of the white noise from the session that Zap mapped. And we're going to persist the session. and close Zap, of course. Now, after you've mapped your uh, site and created a new session, you're going to want to go to Jenkins and create a new freestyle project. You're going to restrict the build to the desired machine. Uh, Jenkins works in two ways. You can either have a master running on itself locally, or you can have a master going off to a slave. Uh, in my current example, I am using uh, Jenkins as a local master running everything on itself. However, on my workplace setup, I have it set up to run uh, jobs on a slave which has SAP installed on it. Uh, the, uh, the purpose of this step is to create the Jenkins workspace, which on the first build does not exist. So when you're trying to load a session, you have to save it into a folder where Zap, uh, that Jenkins can reach, which in this case will be the workspace. So your very first build will just be an empty config with no changes, and you're just going to build. This will create a workspace folder to which Jenkins has read and write permissions to. Now that the workspace folder has been created, this was made by Jenkins. You can create. I've created a folder myself called the Budget Demo, uh, which is. Actually, in this case, the job uh, name. And then this is a custom folder named by me called Budget, and I've copied and pasted my session data into it. The steps for a job configuration are the build step, which is the execute zap step, and then two steps, archive the artifacts and publish HTML reports are post-build steps for the purpose of reporting. You go into your job and you go into configure. The first step, as mentioned, is adding a execute zap step. You configure the host and port, the Java JDK, as well as how you've installed zap. In this case, if you notice, it's the zap proxy home with the additional installer. You configure your path to the zap settings. You load the session, which is in your workspace. In this case, you're providing a very unique context ID. Uh, it will fail if you provide the same context name that already exists as part of the session. You include... Sorry, just pause it for a second. Uh, or I did not. Please pause. Just clearing your head a little bit. Sorry about that. Over here, you are going to provide a. I don't know if you can see this. 
Yes, we can. Correct. Yeah. Can you full screen it? Yeah, can you full screen it so we can all see it? Perfect. Yeah, good. Thank you. Okay, there we go. So I'm just going to pause this a little bit. In this phase, you've configured uh, the laser pointer. You've configured your Zap settings panel, and you've specified the session which you want to load. We are not doing a Selenium script. We're just taking the session which we mapped previously. Now we are going to provide. context name, otherwise it will break as I mentioned, after which you will include the URLs that you want as part of the context. In this case, I want the budget store and everything that uh, falls under the budget store. And the things that I'm going to exclude from the context sorry, is the logout. I do not want it to proceed to the logout at all. Since this site does have authentication, I am going to add an authentication method, in this case form-based, by providing my username, my password, and my logged in indicator, just as I would as in a normal Zap UI setting. The other things that I have to provide is the target, which in this case is my login page, the username parameter, and the password parameter, as well as any other extra post data, which I don't have in this case. In the Zap UI, you would be right-clicking on your application and then saying attack, and then you would pick a spider or active scan. It will tell you that this is the starting directory. In this case, you are uh, physically entering this value, which is the budget store. After which, you uh, select what kind of scan you want. In this case, we're picking a spider scan that is recursive and it does not only include the subtree, and it has an infinite children to crawl. You can change these settings if you'd like. It gives you some of the functionality that the Zap UI does. After which, we will be selecting an active, active scan. In this case, we're selecting the recurse policy, just like which is the default for Zap. And then you can select a policy to use. In this case, you only see the default policy in the list. However, if you create custom policies in the Zap UI, they will be saved in your Zap settings location as policy files. As long as you have those there, you will have a populated list here of various pop uh, policies that you can use, of various intensities. So if you only want to run an SQL injection scan, you are able to. Finally, we want something to be able to show and present. Uh, we're going to clean the workspace of. We're going to clean the workspace of any previous reports, and then we're going to select generate a report. using a custom uh, plugin for Zap, which is called Export Report, also made by myself. And I am simply selecting the export formats that I want. I provided a file name, which is also unique, and it contains the Jenkins build ID, which in this case should be build2. I've exported the XML and the XHTML reports, and the JSON. And then I'm customizing the report with a title and other descript descriptors, such as which uh, by which for when the scan date was, when the report date was, scan version, the report version, and a simple description. Very simple step here, if you notice, is it asks you what you want to export the alert severity, and the alert details. So if you do not want to see, as part of your report, any information on lower alerts, you don't have to. You simply uncheck these boxes, 
and you can only take the high alerts and the medium alerts. Similarly, the details that are demonstrated for each report, for each report, the CWID, WASC ID, description, of an for solution reference, you can include as much of this or as little of this information as you want. Finally, it's time to add our uh, post-build actions. Want us to archive uh, the files? In this case, we want the zap log and the reports. All we are going to provide is, uh, these are natively stored in the workspace originally under the box and reports folders. So we're gonna take everything that's under the box folder and everything that's under the reports folder. Uh, you can ignore this warning, uh, which says that the folder does not exist and it doesn't have anything because it is not currently created. Finally, we're going to add another uh, post-build action, which is called publish HTML reports. To which we'll add just the directory, which is the reports directory as mentioned. The name of the file that we want to archive, which has to be the same as the name above that we specified. But in this case, it includes the extension. And then a report title, we'll call it last vulnerability report. Once you're done that, you can simply press build now, and a background zap uh, scan should begin. You can see from the console output, you can check all of your settings and see how the API calls have been configured. You can see zap booting up now, as well as the settings for spider and the active scan. You can check it attempting to authenticate, and running through. Uh, so for now, this scan actually took a little bit longer, but I skipped that segment. The scan took a total of seven minutes, but for the purpose of the video, I trimmed that part out. Uh, once your scan is complete, you will see a build screen, in this case, build number two, with the archives that we have, which is the zap log, as well as the JSON export, the XHTML ex uh, export, and the XML export. You'll be able to see the results for the full zap log for that session. Just as you would if you were using the zap UI and it will let you investigate any zap related errors and report them. <coughs> or you can take a look at the actual XML report now from your gen condition. The last vulnerability report will always be the latest XHTML report that you've generated for the purpose of this job. Whereas each build will have an archive of that build's uh, XHTML report. If you now take that session, uh, which performed the scan, so you just ran a, a scan from Jenkins, and, you, uh, and Jenkins closed that. You take that session, and you load it in Zap, you will see that the report count is one to one. You have two high alerts, two high alerts in the report, two medium alerts, two medium alerts, five low, five low, and one informational. Numbers all match up as well. So it's now very important that you have one to one reporting between not just Zap and the reporting tool itself, but Jenkins and uh, Zap. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Uh, you can see any documentation on our wiki page. Uh, the links are provided above. If you have any questions or troubleshooting, you can always ask on our Google group. And issue tracking will be done on the Jenkins Jira. I really want to thank you for your feedback because our future development will always depend on what you want to see as part of this plugin. We always welcome open contribution to the project results. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Goran. I think let's give about from 5,000 miles away and live at that much. Okay, um, I'll ask some questions, but I've got one question for you, Goran. So, you know the export report plugin you talked to, said it was yours. Is that yes. now actually already built into the uh, released uh, uh, plugin? No, I do believe you have to go to the marketplace and download it. Right. Uh, what are the plans to actually uh, make it available? 
Uh, I, I was planning on making it a beta first. Uh, one of the things that I want to add to it before pushing for beta release is adding the option to export as a Google Doc, as a PDF, and as wiki markup, and potentially as a bootstrap report. So there were other report formats that I wanted to push first before pushing it into the uh, and asking for it to become beta and then part of the core in the future. All right, okay, thank you. A any questions, guys? Any Dennis, questions? I think you have a <coughs> do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Uh, is that uh, I think it will not work. I think you have to ask it here. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely can't hear anything from all, right. all the way back. So, there. can you hear me? Yes. All right. So, uh, the, the key thing that uh, I want to work on this is is the automation of the whole process without any clicks. So, I'm working on this thing where I'm actually setting up Kubernetes and I'm firing up Jenkins, and the whole point is. It, it built in the morning and gets destroyed in the afternoon. So, okay. so the key is to be able to configure all this stuff without actually having to use it to do any clicks. Have you done any of that? Uh, configure a Jenkins job itself without any clicks? Yes, yeah, so that's all those steps, all the steps yep. that, you know, that we need to put, put that in a kind of a, a build file or a set of scripts. That then you can you can always run that as a Selenium Python script, have, Sel uh, have Selenium start up Jenkins for you, have Selenium navigate to the job that you want to create a new job for you, and perform all the steps that you would initially want to have to do, that you would initially do manually. So you can always automate the task using Selenium uh, and the web driver if you wanted to. Okay. Thank you very much, Grant. I think we're short of time, so I think I'm going to move on to the next talk. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank for you very much. Time. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you.